Okay guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. On this channel, I teach mathematics, science, biology, and also revise past examination question papers. So in today's video, I will be revising science paper one. This is the paper that was written last year in November 2021 by internal candidates. All right. So if what I'm doing on this channel is what you are interested in, please consider hitting that subscribe button and turn on the notification so that YouTube updates you whenever I upload a new video. All right. Without wasting much of your time, let's go straight into the video, guys. All right. So here we are in the video and this is question number one which reads when converted to a base unit in scientific notation 2GB is in. So they want this 2GB how can we convert it in a base unit in scientific notation. So what you should know is that in this value is written as a prefix all right so to convert it to a base unit in scientific notation you have to express the prefix g there as its representative multiple of 10 so that g has got a, a representative multiple of 10 so this is uh 10 to power 9 so 2gb will be written as e, 2 times 10 to the power 9 byte. Alright. So this simply means now our answer is D. So let's go straight into question number 2 which reads which of the following is a derived unit. Alright. Which of the following is a derived unit. Alright. So what you should know before answering this question is to understand what a derived unit is. So a derived unit is a unit expressed as a combination of base units so there are some units that we write or we express as a combination of other units known as base units so ampere kelvin meter these are base units however pascal is a derived unit so our answer here is d a3 reads a car moving at 3 meters per second increases its velocity or increased its velocity uniformly to 9 meters per second in 4 seconds. Find the uniform acceleration of the car. So for you to be able to answer this question unless you know the formula for calculating acceleration which is V minus U over T. Alright, so uh, this V here represents the final velocity and U represents the initial velocity and T represents the time and that A represents actually acceleration. All right. A car moving at 3 meters per second increased its velocity and uniformly. So the velocity was increased uniformly to 9 meters per second in how many seconds? 4 seconds. So you can see that 3 meters per second is initial velocity while 9 meters per second is the final velocity. All right. So you can now substitute these values into the formula. So where there's the final, you put 9 meters per second. Where there's the um, initial, you put 3 meters per second. And where there's a T, you put a uh, time there, which is a 4 seconds. All right. Then you are going to subtract now. Uh, 9 minus 3 which will be 6, 6 divided by 4 which will be 1.5 meters per second squared. So our answer now becomes A. So let's go to question number 4. Question number 4 reads, a rock weighed 8.0 newtons on the moon where the acceleration due to gravity is 1.6 newton per kilogram. Calculate the mass of the rock on Earth where the force of gravity is 10 newton per kilogram. So we are being asked to calculate the mass of the rock. So uh, on Earth, where the force of gravity is 10 newton per kilogram. All right. So now, for us to be able to answer this question, we must know the formula that connects the force and the mass, which is the weight is equal to mass times the acceleration. All right. On Earth. What will be the mass of this rock which weighed 8.0 uh, on the moon? So, uh, since we are looking for mass, we must first make mass the subject of the formula as mass is equal to weight W divided by G, which is acceleration due to gravity. 
this question appears to be confusing a little bit, but because of this term that we've used here, gravity is 10 newton per kilogram. So gravity is a force the same as weight, but I understand in this case they were using it as acceleration due to gravity. So if that is the case, that means our weight is 8.0 newton, and then our acceleration due to gravity is 10 newton per kilogram. Uh, that means that we are now supposed to substitute where we have weight, we place 8.0 newton, and where there is gravity, we place 10 newton per kilogram. So after substituting our values in, in the equation, we have 8 divided by 10, then 8 divided by 10, it is going to give us weight as 0 0.8 kilogram as our weight. So our answer again here is A. All right, so let's go to A5. A5 reads, the following diagram shows a pilot in air after jumping from a plane. As he falls, how will the size of the forces acting on him change before he attains terminal velocity? All right, so what you should understand is that the terminal velocity is uh, the speed of an object as it falls when the downward force and the upward force become equal or balances all right so then an object falls with a constant velocity called the terminal velocity so when an uh, a pilot jumps from the airplane as he begins falling make sure he will reach a point where he will have terminal velocity so at that point when the pilot is about to reach terminal velocity so the downward force must decrease while less the upward force must begin increasing. So at that point, the resultant force also must decrease. So this tells us that our answer must be D. All right, so let's go to question number six. Question number six reads, the following diagram shows a 30 centimeter spanner used to turn a nut with a force of 60 Newton. Find the moment of the force. So we are being asked to find the moment of the force. So moment of the force is given by uh, M is equal to F multiplied by D, where M is a moment and F is a force and D, D is a distance, all right? So now this will tell us that uh, our force provided in the question is that one there, and then our distance is here. Then what we are going to do next now is to substitute, all right? So we are going to get our force, put it there, and our distance, we will also put it there. And this will give us a uh, moment is equal to 6 times 0 0.3. So our distance there, which is 30, must be in meters. So we divide it by 100 to convert it into meters. So it becomes 0 0.3. Then you multiply 6 times 0 0.3, and this gives you... 1.6 newton meters so this simply means again that our answer is a all right so let's continue uh to question number seven so question number seven reads the following diagram shows a thermos flask identify the parts that prevent heat loss by convection so you should understand that convection is the process of heat transfer in liquids and gases through convection currents. So convection only takes place in gases and the liquids. So when you look at this apparatus, which part of it tries to prevent heat loss by air or also by water? So here you can only see that it is only uh, F. So F is a vacuum. So that part is vacuum. So it is evacuated air is removed so that heat does not get conducted by um, convection. So the answer here becomes a B. All right, so let's go to another question. This is question A8. So question A8 reads, which of the following is not true about dull black surfaces? They are good A, absorbers of heat. It's true. Um, dark I mean, dull black surfaces, you know that they are good absorbers of heat. That's why it is not advised to put on a, a black cloth in a hot season or in the 
here in hot season like October here in Zambia, you shouldn't be putting on in the sun a dark or black uh, type of a cloth because it will absorb a lot of heat. Your temperature will go high. Then be there saying uh, they are good emitters of heat. Yes, uh, dark black uh, surfaces are also good emitters of uh, heat. Then see they are saying uh, radiators of heat. That's not true. Huh? Dull black surfaces do not reflect heat. They don't. So the answer here is uh, C. Because D again radiators of heat. They give out heat which is also good. So to radiate and to emit. I think this is one and the same thing. So let's go to another question. And this is question A9. Which reads. The following diagram shows an object placed in the path of a beam of light. So as you can see, there's a source of light, then there's an object there, then, then, then there's a screen there. Then the question says, what terms best describes the shadows H, J, and K? Okay, so which shadows will be there? So what you should know that is that J will experience a total shadow because most of the light coming from the source of light will be blocked by that object, all right? While uh, a, a region, regions like H and K will not experience a total darkness. They will have some stray light reaching there. So they will experience partial darkness. So in science, we call partial darkness as a penumbra. That shadow caused by partial darkness, we call it penumbra. And then total shadow, we call it umbra. So here, the best answer is D. All right, so let's go to the other question. And this is question A10. Which of the following is true about images formed by plane mirrors? They are A, diminished, B, magnified, uh, C, upside down, D, virtual. So the answer is D, they are virtual. Then question number 11 says, following diagram shows an image produced by A, by convex lens, the diagram is drawn to scale. Which position A, B, C, or D shows the correct position of the object? So as you can see, when you study this diagram very well, you see that it has an image which is upright. So whenever an image is upright, it is a virtual. And when the image is upright, that means the image and the object are on the same side. And in this situation, the object is in between the image and the lens. So in this case of ours, our answer must be B. All right. So let's go to another question. So this is question 12. So question 12 reads, the following diagram shows a ray of light emerging from water into air. So we have th that ray going upwards there, emerging from water into air, all right? So the question says, which labeled arrow shows the direction of the ray in air, all right? So we have A, B, C, D. So that ray, as it emerges from water and D, enters air. Which direction is it going to go? Is it A, B, C, D? Definitely, it will go into the a direction all right because when light travels from a more dense medium to a less uh, dense medium it diverges away from the normal all right so our answer here is a all right so let's go to 13 a siren from an ambulance or police car has a very high pitch which of the following can change the pitch of a sound wave a amplitude b frequency c velocity d wavelength the answer is b frequency is the one that is related to pitch all right so let's go to another question which is question number 14. so question number 14 reads which of the following materials is most suitable for making permanent magnets we have brass, copper, iron, steel. So steel is the best or suitable material for making permanent magnets because it is not easily 
to magnetize and also easily to, mag to demagnetize copper and brass are not magnetic materials iron is a magnetic material but it is easily to demagnetize and magnetize so iron is suitable for making non-permanent magnets all right so let's go to question number 15 question number 15 reads the leaves of a positively charged electroscope diverged when a charged body was brought near it this proves that the body was a positively charged b negatively charged c neutral of charge then d a good conductor so the answer is a so if you want to understand how i knew that the answer is a click the link the video appearing here on e, static electricity you will understand all right so let's go to question number 16 question number 16 reads the following circuit diagrams show three bulbs of equal resistance connected to a six volt power supply in which of the diagram will all the bulbs light brightest so uh is it a no b no c no d the answer is d and the reason is that um in a the bulbs are connected in series and what you should know now is that in series um voltage differs voltage is not the same in uh, devices connected in series so voltage differs in series so across each of those components or bulbs they will have their own voltages so all these when you look at this series here it's series here we have uh, parallel and series so these they will light up in the same way but this one will be different so this these are connected in parallel so you expect in this diagram here to have all the bulbs lighting with the same brightness all right so let's go to another question this is question number 17 which reads a hair dryer is made of two heaters with a power rating of 400 watts each and a fan motor with a power rating of 100 watts Calculate the cost of using the hair dryer for two hours if a unit of electricity costs 15 way. So now, for you to be able to answer this question, unless you understand how electrical energy is calculated or how the cost of using electricity is calculated. So cost of electricity or rather electricity is sold to consumers in the form of electrical energy energy so if you know electrical energy the total of electrical energy that this dryer is going to use then multiply it by the charge per unit then you will know how much is it is going to be charged all right so the formula we use is this one power is equal to electrical energy divided by time so what we are saying is that this is power p is power then e is electrical energy then t is time so now what we are going to do now is we are going to make uh, electrical energy the subject of the formula like this so once we do it then we'll say electrical cost or a cost of electricity should be p times t which is electrical energy then times c which is the, the cost then we should now understand that p which is power must be this value given here so we have two heaters with a power rating of 400 watts each so this simply means that if each of these heaters is rated 400 watts and they are two meaning the total amount of power they are consuming is 800 all right and then we are told that and a fan and a fan motor with a power rating of 100 watts so if you 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 get the 800 plus 100 that will give us 900 so we have the power of 900 and then here we are told t uh, time there is supposed to be two hours so this dryer when it is operated for two hours all right that is our time and then 
if a unit of electricity cost fifth and where so now we have that information so what we are going to do here is uh, 800 plus 100 it will give us 900 watts and the electricity is not sold in watts but electricity is sold in wattage i mean a kilo watts it is sold in kilowatts so that 900 will change it into kilowatts so 900 watts divided by 1000 it will give us 0 0.9 watts i mean kilowatts so we we'll substitute those values into our equation and that in way will convert it into quarter because that is our main currency so we we'll have where there's power we put 0 0.9 times where there's t two hours times where there's the cost 0 0.5 and when we multiply this we'll get it so our cost will be equal to 0 0.9 quarter so our answer is a so let's go to question 18 question 18 reads the following diagram shows a piece of steel placed inside a solenoid so we have a solenoid there which is a coil inside placed there is a piece of steel and then current starts flowing around it so the, the question says if the switch s is closed and opened several times the end a of the steel bar becomes so what you should know is that uh, whenever current flows into the coil and when inside the coil there's a steel or something like a metal which is in a magnetic is placed there then that metal becomes a magnet all right so that metal becomes a magnet now uh, according to the thumb rule when you curl your fingers in the direction of current these arrows here they represent current when you curl your fingers like that in that direction then your thumb points in the north pole or to the south pole of that magnet that will be formed and the meaning that side a will be actually the permanent south pole so our answer is c all right so let's go to question 19. so question 19 says what is the use of the hot filament in a cathode ray oscilloscope crro it is to here a heat the anode no b heat the cathode yes it is to heat the cathode all right so question number 20 says strontium 90 undergoes a better decay to produce element y which of the following shows the decay equation so before you you you, you go into answering this question you must write the general equation that guides beta decay so this is the general equation which guides beta decay so if you have for example a parent atom like this one represented by x which decays into a daughter atom which is represented by y then it says that the daughter must have the same mass number as the parent so the mass number here a and a they're the same while the daughter the, the atomic number for the daughter increases by one so this z here in the here it increases by one and this is a beta particle all right so a beta particle actually here a beta particle is the emission of fast moving electron when neutrons transform into a proton and the electron so that is a beta particle so now in answering this question of ours uh, since we are told this is strontium now it is going to undergo beta decay so it will be like this so it will have y so y must have the same as this and then the atomic mass must be 38 here plus 1 which when we add here it will produce 39 90 plus this and then this negative and this positive it will give us negative there and when we check from our equation the best answer here is what d so our answer becomes d all right so let's go to the other question and this is section b so here we are on section b which says answer all questions in this section then write your answers in the spaces provided in the question paper so b1 reads the following graph shows a distance time graph of a bus moving from town a to town b so we have a car 
here moving town A to town B. Then A says what is the total distance between town A and the town B. So what you should know is that the vertical axis here represents distance and also the horizontal axis represents time. Alright, so the point at which this graph ends here marks the end of what? Of the journey all right so that also simply means the total distance so if we stretch a line from here to where distance is this one becomes uh, since this is the 50 52 54 56 58 so the total distance here between the town a and the town b is 58 all right so let's go to the next question so the next question says the bus stopped at a station between town A and town B. For how long did the bus stop at this station? So let's bring back our graph. So here our, is our graph. So now we want to know uh, from the graph when the bus stopped or when the car stopped. All right. So how will we know that here on the graph the bus stopped? So here, where the graph is horizontal, that's it. that shows that the distance wasn't increasing. Then that also shows that the uh, bus actually there stopped. So you can see the graph when it is going like this, everything is changing. When it goes horizontal, it means distance in the vertical axis is not uh, increasing while its time is increasing. That means at that particular time, the vehicle stopped for some time. So then they're asking us now to... I find it I'm they're saying for how long did the bus stop at the at this station so we must have to mark at the starting of the stoppage we mark the time there which will be actually 2.2 here then we also know that it, it started moving at this point when the graph started rising again at three so when we say um, the difference in these times actually gives us the time the vehicle spent on the station so we'll say 3 minus 2.2 which will give us 0 0.8 hours as the time this vehicle or bus are uh, spent on the station all right so let's go to another question question c says calculate the speed of the bus between town a and the first station so let's go back to the graph so we should know that however speed is equal to distance times what times the time and when we come back to the graph here, uh, we are told to calculate the distance, the speed of the bus between town A and the first station. So the town A and the station are here. So they want the speed here. So what we are going to do is to use our formula here. So speed is equal to distance over time. So uh, here we'll get our distance from here so when we use we draw a line there we we'll reach at 30 so our distance there is 30 and when we drop a line downward on time here our time will be 2.2 hours so when we substitute those into our equation we we'll have 30 divided by 2.2 which will give us actually 13.6 uh, kilometers per hour as the, the speed there all right so then question number d says calculate the average speed for the whole journey so average speed um going back to our graph average speed must be given by total distance uh, covered divided by total time taken all right so total distance covered on this journey must be this and then the total time taken by the journey i must say maybe we must have subtracted that time it wasn't moving but since that time was also spent in the process of the journey so our total time will be somewhere here all right when the vehicle reached here on town b so total distance from town a to town b total time is actually four hours and the distance covered is actually somewhere from there which will be 58 so 58 divided by uh four so which will give us 14.5 kilometer per hour as our average speed all right so uh, this i mean e says mention one consequence of over speeding accidents of course all right then let's go to 
um, B2, so B2 says, B2A says state Newton's second law of motion. So the Newton's second law of motion says that the acceleration of an object is directly proportional to the force producing it and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Or we can also state it in the form of an equation as the force is equal to, or F is equal to M A, where F is equal to force, M is equal to, I mean mass, then A is equal to acceleration. So you can also state it in that way as long as you are able to explain what those um, uh, letters represent. Alright, so let's go to question B. Question B says the following diagram shows a 4 kilogram box resting on a frictionless surface with forces acting on it as shown. So we have this 4 kilogram box here uh, with forces here. On the left we have 16 newton and also we have 12 newton all right pulling it on the left side and on the right side we have actually 10 newtons all right so let's see the total forces acting on the left side are actually given by uh, 16 newton plus c 12 newton which will give us 28 so on this side we have 28 and on this side we have 10 so meaning the object will go on the left side where there is enough force so for us to know how much force now should overcome this uh, 10 newton which is pulling to the right we must say 28 minus 10 which will give us 18 so the object will be going this way with a force of 18 newton so this force of 18 newton will now cause an object to accelerate that's why the question says calculate the uniform acceleration caused by the force the forces so it is this force now pulling it this way so we know that uh, force is equal to mass times c acceleration all right so we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration and then we are being asked to find the acceleration so make acceleration the subject of the formula as in uh, acceleration is equal to force divided by mass then we'll substitute where there's force we'll put that 18 newton where there's m we'll put it for kilogram then it will be 18 divided by 4 which will give us uh, 4.5 instead of being kilogram it should be actually uh, meters per second so our answer is 4.5 meters per second squared all right so let's go to the next question question b3 says the following diagram shows how energy flows into and out of a coal fired power station so we have a coal fired power station here coal uh, energy is being used here and when energy goes here running this industry here some of the energy is wasted here in friction in the system some of it in this cooling tower to cool every system energy is wasted then some of the energy is wasted here in the transformer 30 joules actually wasted in heating wires in the transformer then 30 i mean 300 joules of electricity is what goes into usage in the power lines all right then the question says how much useful electrical energy is produced by the power station 30 or 300 uh, uh 300 what 300 uh sorry 300 joules all right so let's continue with the question so here we are question b calculate how much energy is wasted from the cooling tower all right so let's bring again the factory or industry here we are on the industry you should know that on this side here we have the source of actually the energy and on this side where the energy is going so this is energy input this side this is the energy output like this energy output energy input and what you should know is that the energy input is always equal to energy output so to to be able to calculate the um, energy wasted we must come up with the equation where we are going to say output energy must be equal to input energy and on the output energy this side here we have actually 70 which is here 70 joules then we have also this wasted energy here then we have also um 
this uh, 30 energy here, 30 joules. Then we have also this 300 joules there. And this should equal to what was put in, which is 1,000 uh, joules. Then if we add all the energies on the left side of the equal sign, this will give us something like uh, energy wasted plus uh, 400, and this will give us 1,000. Then what will happen to that 400? It will cross on the right side of the equal sign to become negative. So we have energy wasted is equal to 1,000 minus uh, 400 joules. So 1,000 minus 400 joules will have 600 joules. So that is the energy wasted. Alright, then question number C says, calculate the efficiency of the power station in producing electricity. So here, what you should understand is that efficiency is equal to energy output divided by energy input times 100%. Alright, so let's bring back our diagram here. So what we mean here is that the energy input is this energy here that was inputted and the energy output is this one so we substitute these into the energy output is actually the en the useful energy that the energy that was used actually not this energy which was wasted you include only energy which was useful so it will be now 300 divided by 1000 times 100 which will give us 30 percent so efficiency is given in percentage so it will be 30 percent as our efficiency right so let's go to the next question so here we are on b4 b4 a says define define convection so we says we said convection is the transfer of heat in liquids and gases by convection currents all right so we are on b b says the following diagram shows an incomplete diagram of Convection currents occurring in nature at night. All right, so we have this diagram and it is showing convection current at night. Then they say, name the breeze. So remember, there are two breezes. Breezes is a, a breeze is actually a cold air felt. All right, if you have been to a sea shore or a river shore, for example, uh, during the day, you could have felt some cold air, some cool, cool air flowing towards you that you enjoyed really, especially in hot season. People go to near to uh, rivers, big rivers to enjoy that cool air that blows from the sea. That one is what we call the breeze. So we call that sea breeze because the cool is coming from the sea. Now this opposite happens at night. At night, it's the cold air which flows from actually um, the, 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 the land to the sea. Because the land, being a good conductor of heat, uh, the heat it conducts during the day. When it reaches at night, it loses all of it. But water being a bad conductor of heat, any heat that it had acquired must take long to be lost so at night it is the opposite so cold or cool some cool air flows towards the sea so that cool now at this time now of the night we will call it land breeze because the breeze will be coming from the land to the sea because it's at night all right so let's go to the next question so question part two says on the diagram, draw convection currents for the for this breeze. So we'll bring the diagram back. Let's bring the diagram back down here. Yeah, so they want us to draw the convection currents for this breeze. All right, so we will complete it like this. So we'll have cold air coming actually on the sea, and then there will be warm air actually going onto the land. All right, so that is it. So let's move to another question. B5 reads, A, list the components of the electromagnetic spectrum in order of increasing frequency. So list to highest, that's what they want. So the components of electromagnets are remembered by this kind of a saying, which we say, rust maze is very unusual X mass gift. So X 
ROST, which stands for actual radio waves, maze, microwave. Uh, so is actually infrared, unusual ultraviolet, very, very actually visible, unusual ultraviolet. So then X, X ray, then we have uh, gift, which is gamma ray. So we say a uh, ROST maze is very unusual X gift, X mass gift. So we say it like this. So these are the components. Now we have radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, X rays, and gamma rays. So this radio is memorized as radio. Radio waves are memorized as ROST maze, ROST, I mean ROST, then microwaves, maze, infra is visible light vary then ultraviolet unusual x rays x mass then gamma rays gift all right so let's go to question b mention one similarity among the components of the spectrum so one similarity is that they have a lot so you choose so they have these they they are all transverse waves travel at the same speed in vacuum the wave equation applied to all of them they all transfer energy so any of these could qualify as the the, the the similarity among the components of the spectrum here these this is their similarities all right then c says mention one difference among the components of the spectrum so the difference is that they have different frequency and also wave length all right or they differ in frequency and the wave length so you could just say they differ in frequency you end there or you could say they differ in wave length that's what i gave two so that you know them so then d says give one harmful effect of the spectrum so you can say it can bring about mutation of exposure to read and also skin cancer all right so let's go to another question this is question number b6 which reads the following diagram shows an ultra sound source sending a sound wave into the human body so we are sending a a sound source into the human body there we are so we are sending sound into the human body so this is an ultra source sending sound into the human body we have a fresh bone another fresh so the bone is actually uh, this distance z then the question says the total time for the ultra sound to travel in the bone from x to y and back to x is 9.0 times 10 to the power negative 6 seconds then a what does the term ultrasound mean so ultrasound means sound with the frequency above 20 kilohertz then let's go to the next question b says if the speed of the ultrasound in bone is 4100 meters per second calculate z the thickness of the bone so let's bring back the diagram here so here is the diagram then they are asking us to calculate the thickness of the bone, which is Z here. So you know thickness is just length or distance. And we are told that this is the speed of ultrasound, excuse me. And here we were told the time it took for this sound to travel and come back was this. So we have time. Uh, speed and then we are being asked the thickness which is distance this simply means that the distance time graph applies so the distance time graph is this speed is equal to distance over time and since we are being asked to find the thickness which is distance so we are going to say distance is equal to um, speed times time then you know that this time provided here is the time they are calling it took for the ultrasound to go and come back all right so we want just the time it spent for going one way so we we'll divide this time by two which will give us 4.5 times 10 to the power negative six seconds so we will now substitute in our equation where there's s we'll put 4100 meter per second where there's t we'll put 4.5 times 10 to the power 
negative 6. So we'll substitute and we'll have this expression. So when we multiply this expression, we'll have 0 0.01845. Now, if we write this according to two significant figures, because I can see these values provided here, they have two significant figures. So we must be, uh, we must also follow in our answering the two significant format they are following. So this will be now 0 0.018 meters or 1.8 times 10 to the power negative 2 meters. All right. So that will be the thickness of Z. Then let's go to the next question. So the next question, which is C, says, mention another use of ultrasound other than medical use. So there are many. So the, here they are. So the medical one is for number one, which is prenatal scan to check the development of babies in womb. But those that are not medical are number two, used by ships to find the depth of a seabed. Three, check for cracks in metal pieces that are too small for the naked eye to see. Uh, then four, uh, for locating sunken ships or shores of fish then this is actually used by fishermen as well. Then five, quality control. Yeah, for quality control, uh, which involves the checking of cracks in concrete, all right, when people are building things, all right? So let's continue. Uh, question B7 reads, define refraction of light so refraction of light is actually uh, the bouncing back of light from a surface that is it then let's go to b b says the following diagram shows a dog and a cat standing in front of a plain mirror then they're saying mirror i mean then they're saying using the diagram show by construction how the dog sees the cat's image all right so how will the dog here see the cat's image in the mirror? So first of all, you draw a ray from the cat onto the surface like that. And then when it falls on the surface, put an arrow on it like it is here. And then you draw a line perpendicular to the surface of the mirror. And then measure this angle. And when we find that angle, uh, transpose that angle to the right and also draw a line from there from this point here to where to the where the dog is and then extrapolate this line backwards and then measure the distance here make sure the distance from the cut to the mirror is the same as behind there and then put the image of the cat there. So that's how the cat is going to be seen by the dog. So the dog standing here, when the cat is here, the dog standing here will see the cat as if it is somewhere there. All right, let's move to another question. So this is question C. Give two characteristics of the images formed by plane mirrors. All right, so guys, if you are finding value in this video, please smash that like button and also let me know in the comments and if you haven't considered subscribing please consider subscribing now by hitting that subscribe button right away all right so let's continue so here they're saying give two characteristics of the images formed by plane mirrors so there are many so here they are one the image formed by a plane mirror is upright it is virtual Literally inverted, same size as the object. The image is as far behind the mirror as the object is in front. So these are the characteristics. You can just choose two of them. So let's move. So here we are, B8. B8 reads, the following diagram shows a graph of voltage against current of a conductor. All right. So here we have current on the horizontal axis, voltage on the vertical axis. The question says, what is the maximum current through the conductor? So the maximum current through the conductor is actually this one here, where the conductor reaches here, starting going that way. 
that actually indicates the maximum current all right where when the the, the vote when the actually a graph starts tilting going that way then that means that it has reached the maximum so it is actually three amps here as you can see so the answer is three amps then let's go to the next question so the next question says calculate the resistance of the conductor when the current is 1.0 amps so let's bring back our graph here so they are telling us that when the current is one here what will be the resistor of the conductor so uh, we have to know the formula that connects the current and the resistor so what we are going to do actually here is to bring the formula which is voltage is equal to current times the resistor and after we do that we'll make resistor the subject of the formula it will be r is equal to v over i then what we are now going to do here is to come on the graph and then move from one then go to the graph and when we meet the graph go to the vertical axis and meet the voltage and when you read here it will be one again because this is zero one two three four five uh, uh let me read again zero one two three four five six seven eight so here it will be one so voltage will be one again so let's say let's substitute so R is equal to 1 divided by 1, which means R will be 1 ohms. So R will be 1 ohms. So let's go to another question. Question C says, calculate the power in the conductor when the voltage was at 6 volts. All right. So we must also know the formula, but let's bring the diagram here. Yeah. So this is our diagram. Then we know that when voltage was 6 here then current must be 3 all right so meaning voltage 6 current 3 so go back to our uh, diagram so say power is given by current times voltage and we know current was a 3 voltage is 6 so multiply these two and get 18 so our power is 18 so let's go to question number 9b which says define a nuclear fission so nuclear fission is the breaking down of heavy nucleus of atoms by bombarding with the neutrons all right so b says uranium 235 when bombarded by a slow moving neutron it disintegrates into barium and krypton plus two neutrons then a i mean one says what is used to describe the products of nuclear fission so those are called uh, fusion fragments all right so let's go to the other part so here we are on part two which says given that the products of the reaction are, are barium uh, 144 56 and krypton uh, 96 plus two neutrons write the equation for the re for this reaction so let's bring back our original question here above there yeah there it is so now it is this uranium after being bombarded so it is this uranium after being bombarded by a slow moving what neutron must disintegrate into this and that and that so we'll just write these equations here so we'll say uh, uranium bombarded by a neutron must give us this barium here plus this krypton plus two neutrons that is it let's move to another question which is question c mention one harm of effect of fission reactions so we can say these reactions can be used in a creation of atomic bomb bomb or bomb which kills living things all right you know these bombs may be good or bad but they destroy living things all right so uh question d says give one advantage of nuclear reactors as a source of full energy all right so uh yeah nuclear reactors as a source of energy also is that you can produce controlled amount of energy and the other factor is that a uh, smaller amount of uranium when used 
produces a lot of energy which can be used to generate electricity all right so let's go to another question oh we here we are on section c okay here we are on question number c so question number c says answer any two questions from this section in the separate answer booklet booklet provided so c1 reads okay so let's start answering right away so c1a reads describe an experiment on how you can determine the lower fixed point of a thermometer the answer is that to determine the lower fixed point the unmarked thermometer must be placed in a glass funnel kept full of small pieces of pure ice this marks the zero degrees celsius all right so let's go to another question so this question says give two differences between a laboratory thermometer and a clinical thermometer all right so what you should know is that one a clinical thermometer measures the temperature of the human body while the laboratory thermometer measures the temperature of objects in the laboratory all right so another difference is that a clinical thermometer measures or a clinical thermometer has a short range uh, that ranges from 35 degrees Celsius to 42 degrees Celsius, while a laboratory thermometer has a large range that ranges from actually uh, negative 10 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. All right, so these are some of the differences. So let's go to question C. Question C says, mention one way in which you can improve the air, I mean one, sensitivity of a thermometer, two, accuracy of a thermometer. So let's go to sensitivity of the thermometer so we can increase or improve the sensitivity of the thermometer through uh, the use of large bulb narrow capillary tube thin wall of the bulb so here what it means is that when you are using actually a large bulb it may be exposed to a larger surface area of conduction so it will be able to conduct that heat very very quickly all right and very much heat enough heat for it to be able to respond all right then narrow capillary tube so the capillary tube must be narrow so that any slight movement or expansion of the whatever liquid is being used uh, the movement or change must be seen because the capillary tube is narrow and then the other one is a thin wall of the bulb so that bulb, large bulb, must have thin wall to allow a quick transmission of heat from the outside into the inside of the bulb, all right? So let's go to uh, two says uh, accuracy of a thermometer. So with accuracy, we said uh, through the use of, uh, uh, of mercury as a liquid for the thermometer, through the, the use of, through the use of small and uniform a graduation and through the use of uniform capillary tube so here what we mean by un by use of the mercury as the liquid uh, in thermometer is that because mercury is known to be a very good conductor of um, heat and also it has a uniform expansion and the contraction so since it is a very good conductor of heat any slight change actually can cause it to actually record temperature change so that will make it uh, more uh, responsive or accurate in terms of giving uh, results of uh, the temperature change then when when we said through the use of a small and uniform graduation we mean on the thermometer it has the markings there so the markings on the thermometer must be very close to each other to allow any slight change to be recorded and be able to be read all right and these uh, markings must be uniform so that whatever change it makes in going up and in coming down for specific temperature that change must be uniform and must be able to be captured and then we said through the use of uniform capillary tube and the capillary tube must be uniform to allow equal volume of liquid movement at any given time at, at any given point in time all right so let's go back to another question which is d d says name d1 says name a device that can be used to measure very high temperatures 
and those that vary considerably. So here they, have, they gave two marks, which uh, I, I, I think that was an error. They're saying name a device. So naming wouldn't require them to award uh, two marks there. So the uh, actually device here is actually a thermal couple, all right? So let's go to another question. So question uh, part two says, mention two devices that use the device you mentioned or you have mentioned in D1 above. So this is in one, uh, clean in place sensors, uh, penetration probes, uh, oven controllers. So those use the thermocouple thermometer, all right? So let's go again to uh, the other question. So C2, C2 reads, the following data was obtained from an experiment to determine the focal length of a biconvex lens. So we have a table here where we have U measured in centimeters with the values of 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. Then we have V with the values measured as well in centimeters which are 44, 37, 32, 31, 28. Then here we have M which can be obtained by V which is these values divided by U, these values here. Then A says copy and complete the table to get all the values of M, which is magnification. Then B says, plot a graph of M against V. C says, determine G, the slope of the graph. Then D says, use the slope G of your graph to determine F, focal length of the lens using G is equal to F divided by, I mean V, divided by f minus one then e says mention one use of this type of lens so let's go straight into the answering all right so let's begin with a so a we are going to copy and complete the table to get all the values of m magnification so we'll copy this table here and then we'll complete the values of magnification here by dividing v with u that means we'll get the values of corresponding value of v divided by its corresponding value which is 30. so when we divide 44 by 30 we'll get 1.5 37 divided by 35 will get 1.1 then when we divide 40 i mean 32 divided by 40 will get 0 0.8 then 31 divided by 45 will get 0 0.7 then 28 divided by 50 will get 0 0.6 All right so here it simply means we are done with the table let's go to another question so question B says, plot a graph of M against V. So let's plot the values of M against V. The values of M, the one we got here, against the values here. All right, so, so to begin our plotting, we are going to have, first of all, the graph upon which the values are going to be plotted. Then we are going to label our graph as M against V. Then what will follow now is to label our axis here. So when you have a graph entitled M against V, according to what we were taught in the question to plot uh, a graph of M against V, it means the values of M must occupy the vertical axis, which is the Y axis, and the values of V here must occupy the horizontal axis which is the x axis so here we'll have m and here we'll have v all right so what it means here is that the values of m here these values here they must be accommodated on the on the vertical axis then this also means that 
um, it means that these values actually they begin from what number 0 0.6 and they end to what number 0 0.1 what? 0 point. they end to 1.5 so this simply means that the values that we are going to put here we should choose a scale of values that must be able to accommodate all our values that we have here so since we are beginning with the smallest value which is 0 0.6 our graph can start with 0 and since our largest value is 1.5 our value can end even at 1.5 or 2. So we begin with 0. Then this one will give it 0 0.5. Then this one will give it 1.0. This one won't 1.5. So we'll just end there. Then the next step is to accommodate also these values on the horizontal axis. That will mean that these values here must be accommodated on the horizontal axis so also here we must also look at our values to give us an idea of the smallest value that we must start with here and the largest value that we must end with so our smallest value is 28 and our largest value is 44 so we can easily start with 20 which will accommodate 28 and maybe we'll end somewhere at 50 to accommodate 44. So we'll begin with 20, 30, 40, 50, maybe 60, for the sake of just labeling everything. So, as you can see now, we have managed to put values on our horizontal axis and the vertical axis. So the next step that we are going to do is now to begin plotting these coordinates here. So we'll take them as a pair like 44 plotted with 1.5. So you come on the graph here and locate 44. This is 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, comma 1.5. 1.5 is here. So 44 comma 1.5 will be somewhere here then we'll go to the next which is a 37 comma 1.1 so 37 is somewhere here 30 31 32 33 34 35 36 37 somewhere here comma 1.1 1.1 1 .1 is somewhere here so put our point there then we'll go to the next tip coordinate 32 comma 0 0.8 so our 32 is somewhere here 30 31 32 comma 0 0.8 so if this is 0 0.5 here then this one will be 0 0.678 so our point will be here then we'll go to another coordinate 31 comma 0 0.7 so 31 is somewhere here 0 0.7 somewhere here then we'll put another point, 28,0.6. So 28 is somewhere here, 0 0.6 is somewhere here. Alright? So after that, now we must draw a line that must pass through these points. But however, as you can look at these points here, when you look at them, they cannot produce a straight line because they are not all of them are lining up together so what it simply means here is that you must draw a best fit line that must at least uh, touch each of these lines here and this is our best fit line so by so doing you would have completed writing your graph or drawing your graph right so let's go to the next question so the next question says determine g the slope of the graph so let's go to the graph so here we need to determine g which is the slope of the graph so to determine the slope of the graph what i did i said c which is graph which is g is equal to 
are 1.5 minus 0 0.8 divided by 1, I mean it divided by 44 minus 32. Where did I get these values? I just picked little points like this point here and this point here on the graph. That's how you find the gradient. Pick two points on the graph. Then I got the coordinate, the y coordinate on the on the vertical axis here, which was which is 0 0.1, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, which is 0 0.8 here, subtracted from another coordinate here, which is 1.5. So 1.5 minus 0 0.8. So the highest value, subtract from it the lowest value. Then you shift to the y, I mean it to the horizontal coordinate here. So you shift it to the horizontal coordinate. So this, that's how I got them. So you shift to the horizontal coordinate here. You pick a value. So this is 30, 31, 32. This is 32 here. Subtract it from another value from here which is 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 44 here. This is how I got this 44 minus 32. Then from there, what you are going to do is to subtract 1.5 minus 0 0.8, you get 0 0.7. Then 44 minus 32, you get 12, like this. Then you divide 0 0.7 divided by 12, you get something like 0 0.8, 0 0.0, 583 like that so this becomes your answer all right so let's go to another question so question number d says use the slope g of your graph to determine f focal length of the lens using the formula g is equal to v divided by f minus one so for us to be able to answer this question um, we must first write our formula g is equal to v divided by f minus 1 and since we are being asked to find f we make f the subject of the formula and this will be f equals v divided by g plus 1 all right so if you don't understand how i came up with this formula let me know in the comment section down here all right so after that, now you are going to substitute this value of g, place it here, so you have v divided by 0 0.0583 plus 1. Then you add these, since they are like terms, so that you have v divided by 1.0583. Then from there, you factor it a bit like this, 1 over 1.0583. V, then you divide 1, 1 divided by 1.0583, which will give you 0 0.945 as your answer. Then here put V because we don't know what V is and what the value it should do have. Alright, so your answer becomes this one here. Alright, so let's continue to another question which is question e so question e says mention one use of this type of lens so it has so many use so we'll mention these ones here correction of vision defects uh, it is also used in simple and the compound microscope it is also used in binoculars also in a telescope and the cameras right so let's go to the next question this is question c3 c3 says state state hooks law so let's state hooks law so hooks law states that hooks law states that That Hooke's law states that the extension of an elastic object is directly proportional to the applied force, provided the elastic limit is not exceeded. All right, so let's go to the next question. B. B says, 
the following table shows the readings of a pointer of a scale for different masses attached to it at different intervals. So we have, let me read again, they are saying the following table shows the readings of a pointer of a scale for different masses attached to it at different intervals. So we have masses here that were attached to a scale and these were the pointer readings when the masses were attached to the scale. So when the, there was no mass attached to the scale, the pointer reading was pointing at 120 millimeters. When 0 0.2 kg was attached to the scale, the pointer was pointing at 126 millimeters. When 0 0.4 kilogram was attached to the scale, the reading was 132 millimeters. When a 0 0.6 kilogram was attached to the scale, the reading was 138. When a 0 0.8 was attached to the scale, the reading was 144 millimeters. Then the question says, copy and complete the table to determine the force acting on each mass on the spring. So they need uh, to copy this table and complete it by what? By putting here the force that was acting on the scale. So what it simply means is just converting these masses here into force by multiplying by multiplying them by 10 because force or weight is equal to mass times acceleration due to gravity which is 10 given by this formula here so this one force it which is also weight will be equal to uh, a mass times acceleration due to gravity so it means you multiply this value here which is mass by acceleration due to gravity which is always 10 you put where here so now, what we are now going to do is to go to copy this. So copy the table here and we'll multiply it. Uh, 10 by this value 0, we'll get 0 here. Then 10 by 0 0.2, we'll get 2. 10 by 0 0.4, 4. 10 by 6, 6. 10 by 8, 8. So we are done with this table. Let's go to the other part of the question. So the other part of the question that we should look at is part 2, which says plot a graph of force against extension. So come to the plotting of the graph of force against extension. So what we are going to do is to draw force against extension is what we are supposed to plot and then bring our graph here then from here what we are going to do now is to actually now label since this is the force against extension we should label our axis so the vertical axis should have force and then this horizontal axis should have extension so extension are these regions here, how the spring was extended as the masses or force of these were acting on the scale. So now from there, what you do, make sure that these values must be accommodated on the vertical axis. So to do so, you must look at the smallest value, which is 0, and the highest value, which is 8 and see how they can be accommodated on the vertical axis so this is simple you can just begin with the zero here and then you go to two four six eight if you want you can say even ten but i didn't mind that so meaning that these values can be accommodated here then you also look at how these values here they can be accommodated on the horizontal axis. So you look at the numbers, you start with 120 as the smallest you have, then the highest is 44. So the values that you must put here 
must make sure that they accommodate, they accommodate these values here. So you start with 120, 130, 140, 150. So once you are done like that, now you begin plotting pair by pair. Zero or 120 comma zero, which will be the point here. See, here. so 120 and zero, they are occupying this point here. Then you shift to 126, two. So 120, 121, 122, 123, 124, 125, 126, two. It will be somewhere here. Because this is where two is from the first part. Then you shift to 132 divide uh, against 4. So this is 130, 131, 132 against 4. Then 138 comma 6, 138 is somewhere here, comma 6 here. Then 144 comma 8, 144 somewhere here, comma 8, somewhere here. Then what you will do now, you draw a line passing through these. So this simply, uh, these points appear to be aligning. So it will be a straight line that must go through all these points then after that you are done let's go to the other question uh, part three says part two part three says determine the extension for a force of five newton determine the extension for a force of five newton so what you are going to do you come back to the graph for you to be able to determine the extension for you to be able to determine the extension for the force of 5 newton first of all you must find what we call the spring constant which is given by the gradient of the graph so we'll first determine the spring constant which is the gradient of the graph so we'll say for us to be able to determine the spring constant we must have two points on the graph to determine the gradient so this will now give us the data that we use to find the gradient. So say gradient is equal to, which is spring constant, 8.0 minus 2.0 divided by 144 minus 126. So we'll come on the uh, first point here and get this point here minus here, which is this point here, 2. So this is 8 minus 2 then you come here again you come down which will be 144 this 144 minus it you get from here to there which will be 126 that one there then you subtract this minus that you will get 6 this minus that 18 then you divide 6 divided by 18 you get 0.33 as your spring constant then after you have found the spring constant bring the formula which connects the extension the formula which defines extension which is equal to force is equal to k which is spring constant times e which is uh, uh, extension so f we are saying this is force the k spring constant then e extension then after that you make E, the subject of the formula because that's what you are being asked to find so you say E is equal to F divided by K then you are going to substitute where there is F you put force then where there is K you put uh, 0 0.3 so F force you were told the for, for the force of 5 Newton so you put it here then the spring constant you put it here then you divide you find that the extension is 5 15 millimeters then let's move to the other question uh, which is c say c says differentiate between plasticity and elasticity so so here we are told that or you should know that elasticity is the ability of a material to return to its original position when stretched and released while plasticity is the ability of the material to or the ability of the material not to return it to the to its original 
position once the straight can be released so at this point guys we have come to the end of our revision if you enjoyed and liked and you learned something give this video a like and also comment and if you haven't yet subscribed consider subscribing so that you don't miss out on my next video that will be looking at science paper 2 all right thank you for watching and please bye and peace